This is 42. Let's pray and then let's dive in. Our great God and Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel, for saving us, for writing our names in the book of life, for preparing a place for us even now with the promise of coming to receive us unto yourself, and we will be in paradise with you forever. Thank you for the gospel again. Thank you for good news in a world that only has bad news. We're asking you, Lord, to give us our daily bread today. We're asking you, Lord, as the risen Savior who walks in our midst to meet each of us where you find us. But good shepherd that you are, please don't leave any of us where you find us. Lord, we're asking for a word from heaven. John the Baptist said, a man can receive nothing of value unless it comes from above. So we lift our eyes up to the mountains from where we know comes our help. Our help comes from you. Bless this time in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read Genesis 42, and I would just like to give a little bit of a backdrop. As you know, in Genesis chapter 12, after the flood, God selects a idol-worshipping man by the name of Abraham. He doesn't select them for any good that he was doing. It doesn't mean Abraham worshipped idols a little less, that he, you know, made obeisance to demonic spirits a little less than others. It wasn't for any good works that he had done. It was just according to God's electing grace. He calls Abraham, and Abraham, growing up with nothing but idols, sees for the first time the true and living God, leaves all of his comforts, leaves everything, and just begins a walk by faith. God makes a covenant with this man, Abraham, and promises that through him, not only would he give him multitudes of family beyond what the stars in the sky could reach, beyond what the sands and all the beaches could reach, but also and ultimately through him would come the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So starting with this messianic line, Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel or the Israelites. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph. Joseph's brothers, the others, hated him. And they conspired to betray him. And to betray him in the worst way, they threw him in a pit, like a stranger, like an animal, left him in the pit during the anguish of his soul and his begging to come out. You talk about having the worst thing you could ever imagine happening to you. He goes from just going to check on his brothers, normal business, to his brothers making faces at him like he's never seen before. They throw him in a pit. He's realizing as time is elapsing, it's not a game. They're really leaving him there, and it doesn't end there. A band of Ishmaelites come riding by. They yank him out of the pit like they never knew him, and they sell him to the Ishmaelites, who then takes this roughly 17 or 18-year-old down to Egypt. Down in Egypt, it doesn't even end there. God blesses him, so he becomes the accountant for the bodyguard of the Pharaoh, God's favor is on him. God never leaves us or forsakes us. The word keeps saying, but God was with Joseph. And this happened, but God was with Joseph. But it doesn't end there because Potiphar's wife develops a lust for him and comes on to him so strongly. And he says, how can I do this? After all he's been through, he's still got his eyes on the Lord. He still does not want to sin against God. He doesn't take his afflictions as an opportunity to justify him being selfish and self-absorbed. He's still saying, how can I sleep with you? Not just because you belong to another man, but how can I do this and sin against God? Well, then she then flips it and says that he tried to rape her. He's thrown in prison. He goes from merely checking on his brothers to being betrayed and thrown in a pit by his brothers, to being sold to the cruel Ishmaelite slave traders and taken down to Egypt. And then he goes from that to being put in prison and his name becomes muddier than mud. It becomes sewage as the man 
who tried to rape the king's bodyguard's wife. But God is with him. And God raises him up in God's timing and with God's preparation. In today's message, we're looking at all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who've been called according to his purpose. He, in God's perfect timing, ends up becoming number two in the entire world. His brothers obviously think he's gone and dead. A famine now breaks out in that part of the then known world. And Jacob, who's now back home with the other brothers, still mourning because he thinks that Joseph died. Remember when the brothers came home, they didn't say, oh, we threw him in a pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. They took Joseph's coat off him, similar to when, you know, they stripped Christ's garments off him. They took his coat off him, killed an animal, put animal blood on the jacket, and then brought the coat home and said, your beloved son Joseph, our beloved brother, was killed and eaten by wild beasts. So here's Jacob now with the remaining siblings, still mourning the loss of Joseph, but a famine is in the land, and they're going to starve if they do not go to Egypt and go and get some grain. So let's begin reading Genesis chapter 42. It says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why are you looking upon one another? It's kind of like when a parent asks their kids to do something and the kids are just kind of still staring at each other. It's like, wait a minute, why are you guys looking at one another? Like, I told you guys to do something, you know? And he said, behold, I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down there, buy for us from there so that we can live and not die. This famine is intense. And Joseph's 10 brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob did not send with his brethren because he said, unless peradventure mischief befalls him. This shows that even though the brothers came home with Joseph's coat covered in blood, even though the brothers put on, I'm sure, their saddest face in saying, your son, our brother's been killed, it shows that Jacob never really believed his own sons. So much so that he won't let the youngest one, Benjamin, go with them. See, though these 12, many of them were half-brothers because they were had all by Jacob, but with four different women, Benjamin was the only full-blooded brother of Joseph. So he sends them to go get corn, but he says, you know what? Mm -mm. Benjamin's going to stay with me because in his heart, he didn't even trust his own kids. He sensed that there was foul play. So he won't let Joseph's full brother Benjamin go, lest they come back with yet another story of wild beasts doing something, right? Verse 3. <clears throat> And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So just picture multitudes of people coming from far and wide, all to get corn from Egypt. And Joseph was the governor over all the land. And it was he that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came before him, and they bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brothers, verse 7, and he knew them, but he made himself strange unto them, even spoke roughly to them, changed his voice a bit. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, we come from the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph knew his brothers, verse 8, but they did not know him. Remember, the only reason Egypt even has corn is because Joseph had supernatural dreams and began counseling the king on what to do for seven years so they would even have it. So the king not only made him second in command, but made him the chief administrator over all corn that was given out to people coming from far and wide. So he recognizes his brothers. It's been like 10 to 15 years. They think he's dead. So he's got a full grown beard. He's dressed in Egyptian culture, changes up his voice a bit. They would not even guess. And I mean, just a full grown beard and maybe, you know, just something, a covering from the sun can easily camouflage a person or disguise them, especially if you think the person is dead. Verse 9, and Joseph, when they bowed to him, he remembered the dream that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you're spies. 
You've come to see the nakedness of the land. You're here to look for weak spots. You're spies pretending you want corn, but you're really here to find a way that you can come back and enter in through one of our cracks in the wall or something. Verse 10, they said to him, no, no, my Lord, we're here to buy food and we are your servants. Verse 11, we are all one man's sons. We're not spies. We're true men. Verse 12, and he said to them, no, but I see you're here to see the nakedness of the land. You're here as spies looking for a way to get in. Verse 13, they said, your servants are 12 brothers. We're the son of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is with his father and one is not. They're talking right to the one who they think is dead. And they're saying, one of our brothers is back home and the other one's not alive anymore. And Joseph said unto them, verse 14, the truth is what I've said already. You are spies. Verse 15, this is how you're going to be proved. By the life of Pharaoh, you will not go forth from here except your youngest brother come here. Now, not only is he dying to know how his dad is, Jacob, he also wants to know how is his youngest and his only full brother, Benjamin. You won't leave here. He's pretending to speak to them roughly. You won't leave here unless you bring that youngest one here. And verse 17, he says he put them in the prison for three days. And all of them are in prison now. And Joseph, verse 18, said to them the third day, okay, this is what you're going to do and you're going to live. I'm not going to take your life, but this is what you're going to do because I fear God. Verse 19, if you be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison, and then you go and take corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, and so will your ver- words be verified, and you will not die. And they did so. And look at this. Talk about guilt. Guilt. Even though they never got caught, even though nothing ever happened, look how real guilt is in the human life. They're whispering to one another now in that jail cell, and they said one to another, we are guilty concerning our brother. Joseph is the idea. In that we saw the anguish of his soul, he begged us when we threw him in that hole. He cried. He did anything, young teenager, to get out, and we turned our back on that anguish. When he begged us, and we would not hear. That's why this distress is coming upon us. You see, it is an age-old thing for people to rightly believe that you reap what you sow. And they're saying, you know what? This has come upon us because we are reaping what we've sown. The Bible even teaches that we reap what we sow. God's mercy often intervenes, and oftentimes you know you've sown something really not good, but in mercy, that, that harvest didn't come like it should have come. You know, you ever sow sow something and you're like, okay, Lord, I've sown something really bad. And you always get more than what you throw in the ground. Lord, please be merciful on what comes. And God in his mercy oftentimes doesn't allow that harvest to come. Mercy gets involved. But make no mistake, we do reap what we sow. God is not mocked. So they said this is happening because of what we've done. And it says, verse 23, they didn't even realize that Joseph understood them because he was speaking by an interpreter. He's pretending to be Egyptian and he's speaking by an interpreter. So what does he do? He turns himself away from them and he cried. And then he returned to them again and he communed with them. He took Simeon from them and bound him in front of their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill all of their bags with corn and to restore even every man's money back into his bag, the money they brought to buy the corn with. He says, give them all corn in their bags and put their money back in their bags without telling them. And he even gave them provisions for the way. Thus he did to them. You could see Joseph, even though he's not yet revealing himself to them, He still is loving them, giving them corn for free, even giving them provisions for the way. Gave them granola bars and trail mix and some coconut water, you know, for the journey. You know what I mean? And this is just the heart of Christ. He could have been the prime candidate to be as bitter as bitter can be. And this man has surrendered his life to the Lord. This man has surrendered to all things working together for good. This man understands that it's all the Lord's working and he has nothing to give them but the very heart of God. So, verse 26, they loaded up their donkeys with the corn and they left. Verse 27, but when one of them opened his bag to give his donkey some hay at the inn, he saw his money and behold, it was in the bag's mouth. 
Verse 28, he said to his brethren, hey, my money's restored. And oh, no, it's in my bag. And all of their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that God has done to us? We're not, we're, he already thinks we're spies. Now he's going to think we're thieves. How'd my money get in my bag? Verse 29, and then they came to Jacob, their father, into the land of Canaan, and they told him everything that happened to them, saying, the man who was the Lord of the land, he spoke roughly to us. He took us for spies of the country. And we said to him, we're true men. We're not spies. We're 12 brothers, verse 32, sons of our father. One is dead, and the youngest one is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, this is how I will know that you're true men. Leave one of your younger brothers here with me and take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then I I will know that you're not lying spies is the idea. I'll know that you really do have brothers and there really is another one and you're not just giving me some emotional story. You bring that little brother back and then I'll believe you. But that you are true men and I will deliver you your brother and then you will traffic in the land. And it came to pass, verse 35, as they emptied their bags, all of them now, not just the one of them, but all of them now, behold, Every man's bundle of money was in his bag. And when both they and their father Jacob saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Can you imagine this now? There's a famine going on in the land. You've sent down your sons to go and buy corn. They return minus one. So now you've already seemingly lost one son who's died by quote-unquote wild beasts. Now your second son is there bound in prison, being watched as a spy and as an enemy of the state, and now they're saying your third one, your youngest born, the, the, the love of your life, Rachel, gave birth to this youngest one right before she passed away, and now this man in Egypt is demanding that one go too? Jacob, verse 36 he said unto them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and now you're going to take Benjamin away. Underline this, all these things are against me. He is feeling like everything that could go wrong is going wrong. Everything is against me. He doesn't say more is against me than is for me. His conclusion is everything is against me. I am in a place of sorrow where no more sorrow could be added to what I already feel. I'm in a place of confusion where no more confusion can be added to what I already feel. I'm in a place of just feeling overwhelmed where no other news could overwhelm me anymore. I'm so discouraged, nothing else could discourage me more. Everything is against me. Everything is against me. Has anyone here ever felt that way? Where you just feel like there could not be any more stuff, any more burden, any more bad news. Everything is against me. Then our question begins, where is God? And you understand the Psalms of David where even he was brought to a place where he says, Lord, have you forsaken me? And will you forsake me forever? And where are you? King David said, I wish sometimes I could just be a bird and just fly away somewhere and just be at rest. You ever feel that way? Where you're just surrounded by so much going on, you just are jealous of the bird. You just see the bird just fly and disappear into the thick of the forest. And you just say, I just wish I could just be the bird, fly away, no one know where to find me. And I just lay in just a bed of straw up there until I feel like coming back. King David wrote that. We'll feel that way. All these things are against me. All these things are against me. It might be time for you. Someone may have just come through this. Someone here might actually feel this way right now. Maybe you want to. This may be a good time to just take out a pad and a pen or wherever you keep your notes and just, what are the things that you feel are against you, that are just against you? It brings no smile. 
It brings no joy. Matter of fact, when the thought or the remembrance comes along, your smile vanishes, your joy vanishes, your peace vanishes, your sleep vanishes. You try to suppress it because the minute you begin thinking about it, the minute you begin feeling like everything is against you. All of us know what this is like to say all things are against me. Charles Spurgeon said, speaking on Psalm 23, when it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. He said that every believer will know what it is like to journey through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't call it the valley of death. You don't die there, but it's the valley of the shadow of death. You feel as though you could just fall over and die, die of a broken heart, die of being overwhelmed, die of your physical frame, just not being able to handle all of the mental turmoil. You feel as though you could die. And Spurgeon said, every believer will find themselves experiencing the valley of the shadow of death. And it will usually be something that even if you keep a prayer journal, it will be too painful to even journal about. All of us know what this is like or will know what it's like when our flesh wants to cry out, everything is against me. Everything is against me. You know, when I first got saved, I can think of many valleys of the shadow of death that I've been in as a pastor and even before I became a pastor. But you know, when I first got saved, I experienced probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life where my brother, who is two years younger than me, my best friend, we grew up together, you know, single parent home, latchkey kid together, fried hot dogs and ramen noodles together, you know, been through tragedy together, people breaking in our house while we're home together. We went through everything together, you know, so much like twins, you know, that he could pick up the phone if my girlfriend at the time called and he could pretend to be me. And for an hour, I walk in the door, he's pretending to be me, talking slick, you know, to my girlfriend, you know what I mean? Making it seem like it's me. You know, that I turn around, I could do the same thing to him. And, you know, just that close, looked alike, acted alike, talked alike. And when I gave my life to the Lord, my brother got caught up in some stuff. He got caught up in some stuff that wasn't good. He got caught up in some stuff that was evil. Uh, some spiritual stuff that he was not to go near, which none, no one is to go near. You know, they sell Ouija boards and Toys R Us and tarot cards in Barnes and Noble as though, you know, this witchcraft stuff is just fun and games, you know, but this, it, there is black magic. And I don't know the details, but my brother got caught up in something. And just like all of us, you know, you're, you're sniffing at a curiosity and curiosity gets you. And my brother turned into something and my brother became afflicted with something that honestly, if you're even familiar with Stephen King's Exorcist, the things I saw my own brother do um, would, would, would even outreach stuff that was done in that movie. So the love of my life, just like that, became someone that one, I didn't even know anymore, but two, became something uh, that I just could not deal with and someone that the evil actually was, was against what I stood for. And I can remember at that time, I was newly saved. I was only saved for like six months. So I had been weaned off of, you know, raunchy secular music, you know. But I remember at the time, Jay-Z had uh, put out a group called Christian. They weren't Christian, but he called them Christian. And they had a song called Full of Smoke. And I can remember feeling like Jacob. All these things are against me. And all I did was drove through my streets back up in Jersey. And I just had this song playing as loud as it would go. And I remember the song just kept saying, I never listened to, you know, the, 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 the parts in the middle, but the hook was watching my life go down, watching my life go down. And I'm driving and all I could say, that song was saying for me the same thing Jacob says. Jacob here says, all these things are against me. I was saying, I'm watching my life go down. And I just kept playing the song over and over and over again. Interestingly, God has been so faithful over the years, and I just continue to pray for my brother and believe great things. But you know how it is with pain. You can just move on. And some things are too painful to even talk about with people. And you just don't bring it up. Like Charles Spurgeon said, you don't even journal about it. You don't even talk about it. It's just that painful. So today I'm driving into church, and I said, you know, I haven't heard this song in so long. I feel like I need to share this in the message. I said, I'm going to play that song just to remember where the Lord brought me from and how dark I felt that day. 
I put the song on, found it on YouTube. As I'm driving, I started crying in the truck. The memory came back that much. I was saying the same thing. All these things are against me. Do you understand, though, that we live in a dimension called time? Yes? Do you understand that time is linear? Meaning that you're either going forward in time or back in time. It's a timeline as if on a chalkboard. God sits outside of time. He is like the one sitting and looking at the entire timeline. He can see the whole thing in one shot. So God can see the past, the present, and the future at the same time. Amen? While God sees Jacob crying out, all things are against me, he sees 2,000 years down the road, Romans 8.28, Paul crying out, and we know that all things work together for good for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen? But let's be real here. Jacob has some real problems going on. He's got a food problem. That's real when you're trying to put food on the table for your family and your little ones. He's got a food problem. He's got a family problem. He doesn't even trust his own siblings and there's an elephant in the room or his kids actually killers. You know what I mean? Doesn't even trust the baby to go with them out of earshot. He's got a family problem. He's got a food problem. But more than that, you know what Jacob has? He's got a faith problem. And isn't it so that even when we get caught in our tailspin of all the things that are going on, we can get so locked up in the smaller problem. Uh, I got money issues. I got bill issues. I got family issues. I got all of this. But the Bible says that all things, we know that all things work together for good. Really, all we ever have is a faith problem. We either believe that all things are working together for our good because we love God, because he called us with a perfect purpose for our life, or we don't believe that. It's a faith problem. That's what it is. It's a faith problem. For one, he's not rehearsing his blessings. And we can all fall in that place where, boom, just like we got sudden amnesia, we can forget all of the blessings of God. Look at how the Lord delivered Jacob when his own brother wanted to kill him, even though he deserved it because he was a liar. Look at how the Lord delivered him from Esau. Look at how the Lord delivered him on a 500-mile journey to Haran full of just killers and and robbers. Look at how the Lord delivered him from his father-in-law Laban, who actually wanted to hurt him as well. Look at how Jesus even came down in Genesis 32 and intimately wrestled with Jacob to bring Jacob to just experience sweet surrender. But you see, he's not remembering any of those blessings He's not remembering how the Lord delivered him from the lion and from the bear and from the Goliath. All he's doing is thinking about the present, and he's saying, everything is against me. Charles Spurgeon said it so rightly. He said, Christians write their blessings in the sand and engrave their complaints in the marble. Isn't it so true? We write our blessings in the sand. What happens when you write something in the sand? No matter how pretty, no matter how much it is just, oh, I didn't know you knew calligraphy. No matter how picturesque it looks, the moment the weather changes and the tide rises, it's gone. You know, here we are saying we remember the blessings of God, saying, oh, yeah, I never forget my blessings. But he said we tend to write our blessings in the sand. And the minute a trial comes, we draw a blank as though we've never walked with God through a storm before though he's never delivered before. But our complaints, though, he says we tend to engrave those in marble. What we need to do is the reverse. We need to write our complaints in the sand because there is a time for going to God and complaining. The word says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. There is a place to take everything to the Lord. Psalm 62, 8, pour out your heart before him. You can just beep. Beep. You could just bring the garbage truck of your burdens, bring it on back, and dump it in the nail-pierced hands of our Jesus. There is a place for that, but we need to switch this and actually write our complaints in the sand and then leave them with him and let them get washed away, knowing that he reigns. And we need to engrave our blessings in the marble. 
He's crying out, all these things are against me. All these things are against me. Everything is against me. I'm sure even spiritual comforters around him could just end up falling into just the emotionalism of the moment and say, I know everything is against you, but guess what? All things were working for his good right here. Again, bigger than his food problem, bigger than his family problem is his faith problem. All things are working together for good. Yes, Joseph was betrayed, thrown in a pit, sold to the Ishmaelites, and taken down into Egypt as a slave. But if you write down Psalm 105, verse 17, it says that God is the one who sent Joseph down there. And why did he do it? He sent Joseph down there to actually preserve the corn of the land to actually sustain Jacob. What Jacob is saying is against him is actually the very thing working to keep him alive. He keeps his son Simeon. The way those boys got handled by the rough Egyptian, quote unquote, they'd have never returned if Simeon weren't there. All things working together for good with even Simeon being there. You see, when we look at things through the lenses of the Lord, everything is clear. God's ways are perfect. He will never leave us or forsake us. He knows the plan he has for our life, plans to bless us, not to curse us, to give us an expected end. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath and anger that was directed at us. The only thing left for us is the cup of salvation and blessing. At the Last Supper, he passes around the cup and he says, drink all of it. He drank all of the cup of rejection and wrath and anger from God that we deserve. The only thing left for us is the cup of acceptance and the cup of blessing. And I love it. He said, drink it down to the last drop. Amen. Are we drinking it or are we just sitting at the table, you know, uneasy with this thing called grace because we have a faith problem and we're just taking little sips and feel like there's some nobility in taking little sips when G Jesus said, be strong in faith, guzzle this down. Guzzle down my goodness, guzzle down my grace, guzzle down my blessings, guzzle down my promises and let them be digested and spread throughout your whole inner being. Are we doing that? Everything here is working for Jacob's good, even though he swears everything is against him. It seems like he's in a place where he'll never be able to come out. But look at what God's doing behind the scenes. Joseph is being used to preserve all of Israel. Simeon is the surety that they will even come back. Benjamin will be the one who will go and Joseph will give him an offering and a food portion five times bigger than his brethren and then finally reveal himself to his brothers. Everything here is working for their good. It couldn't be working anymore for their good, even though we can have a faith problem and when everything's working together for our good, we can just fall back in. Everything is against me. That's why I encourage you now to identify the things that you feel are quote unquote against you. Is there a relationship issue? You feel that is against you. You know, is there just a problem finding work and you feel like maybe something on your resume or something that's not on your resume but should be on your resume, you know, that is against you. You know, whatever it is, what do you feel is against you? People, who do you feel is against you? When are we tempted to say everything is against you and the Bible comes and says, no, everything is working together for your good. Why? Because of what Jesus has done and because Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Isn't it so interesting that Jacob would eventually go down to Egypt when he finds out that your son Joseph is alive? Jacob is being prepared because when he gets to Egypt, He's even going to lay his hand on the Pharaoh, the king of the world, and speak a blessing over his life. Just when we're in a place where we feel like everything is against us is the very time when God is preparing us to be a witness for him even before princes and governors and kings. Again, he didn't just have a food problem or a family problem. He had a faith problem. 
All things are against me. I'll never get in the ministry because of this. That's against me. I've got emotional issues. That's against me. I've got this going on. That's against me. I'm fearful. That's against me. The word says all things are working for your good. If God be for you, who can be against you? Amen? Providence is what we're talking about here. Providence comes from two words, pro, which means beforehand, and video, which means to see. It's to see beforehand. The Lord, by his providence, sees beforehand the problems and the things in our life, sees where he wants to use us, how he wants to use us, who he wants us to minister to. He sees all of that beforehand, and he provides all of the training and the shaping and the molding and the growing our faith for us to be that. Providence is pro-video. He sees beforehand where he's going to take us, and he permits only into our lives what will take us there. Would you write down father filtered? Father filtered means this, that the God we speak about is our friend. The God we speak about is our physician. The God we speak about is our everything. But the God we speak about is our father. If you're a born again believer, God is not just your creator. He's your father. And everything is father filtered. What that means is there's a filter around your life. Even in the book of Job, Satan had to say to God, I can't touch this guy, Job. You've got a hedge around his life. There's a filter around his life. There's a filter around all of our lives, and only what the Father permits can come inside. Everything is Father filtered. And while the Word does not say that everything is good, it doesn't call cancer good. It doesn't call disease good. It doesn't call violence and ugliness and sin good. But it says that he takes all things and makes them work together for our good. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. To really understand this and celebrate this as we ought to, because let's all confess, we are so guilty of knowing this verse so well that we don't know it at all anymore. Maybe you've got it at home on a pillow or, you know, embroidered in like a tapestry, or maybe it's on your bumper car sticker, you know, you know maybe, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the sign off, you know, on your email. We share this verse so much, but do we take the time to be the tea bag, let the word of God be the water, and we just sit in and we just steep in it? It says, please look at Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. Now, mind you, it doesn't say we see all things work together for good because sometimes when we look at what's going on, it does not look like anything good. It doesn't say we see all things working together for good. The Bible says don't walk by sight, walk by faith. So it doesn't say we see all things work together for good. It doesn't even say we feel all things work together for good. Sometimes we can feel something. And because we feel, we feel, and we feel, we know something, our feelings can say, well, our feelings are so strong, it must be true. But I'm always reminded of Elijah. When it came to prophecies, Elijah was always knocking them out the park. You threw it over the plate, his prophecies were home run after home run. But all that being said, there was a time, even after he called down fire, when a prophet was, a man was running up to him and Elijah the prophet says, oh, he's bringing bad news. The man comes up and says, no, all is well. And Elijah says, wow, God has hid this one from me. I was wrong. He felt that he knew something and turned out to be wrong. Even the most spiritual can have wrong feelings. So it doesn't say we see all things work together for good. It doesn't say we feel all things work together for good. We know And notice that God's wisdom is infinite. His thoughts and ways are so far above our thoughts and ways. We can't figure it out. Romans 11, who can even wrap their minds around the infinite wisdom of God? Joseph would become the second in command of all of the then known world. God chose to train him and mold him in a prison for a crime he didn't even commit. God chooses prison to be the training ground to be the second in command of the whole world. Moses led people through a scorpion-ridden desert. But God chose the royal palace as the training for him to spend his life walking through dirt all day. Who can wrap their minds around the wisdom of God? So it doesn't say we know all of the infinite wisdom of God. It doesn't say that. 
It doesn't say we know all of the mysteries of how God works and we know the mystery of evil. It doesn't say that. It just says we know that all things work together for good for them that love God. And notice it's saying all things work together because it's not calling disease good. It's not calling things that just cause heartache and just things that are wrong. It's not calling that good. But what it's saying is just as the apothecary the physician or the, or the pharmacist can take a bunch of different things and make a formula that the formula itself, the whole thing together is working for good. Notice it doesn't say we know that all things work for good because some things alone will just be poison. Some things alone are just poison. But when all things work together, it means when you take that one thing that in and of itself is poison and you mix it with this and this and that and that, it now becomes a spiritual tonic. One of the elements alone might kill you. Two of the elements alone might kill you. But these two elements balanced out with these two coupled with this now turns into a tonic. It's, it's all this working together. Not just the one trial, not just the one heartache, not just the one issue going on, not just the one thing with the economy or your money, you know, whatever, or home life, but it's everything together works for good. You know, my son received a nasty concussion three weeks ago, had us all very scared, took him to the doctor, and, you know, because of the concussion, you know, his left eye was not moving uh, the same as his right eye. You know, it was delayed in moving, and we could see that. He wasn't himself. And, you know, you watch your child, you know, go from being just so sharp and just the acuity God has blessed him with to just, just not being there. And you can't even look with a concussion to see, well, how purple is the bruise on the arm? How purple is the bruise on the knee? You can't see inside the skull. You have no idea how bad it is. So I did my research and I took him down to Chinatown to a reputable Chinese doctor, just as our doctors go to medical school here to learn Western medicine, which I'm not opposed to. Uh, you have doctors in the East that go to medical school just to learn traditional Chinese medicine, TCM. So I sat down with this doctor and he said to me, I'm going to give your son a mixture of herbs. Now, mind you, I went home and Googled every one of them. Some of them were like 30 characters long, but I Googled them. I'm going to research everything going into my baby boy's system. My body, okay, whatever. 40, 41, been around the barn a few times. All right, we'll deal with it, but, but not baby boy. I researched it all, and what he said is, when you read, you're going to see this one say only this. You'll see this one say only this. You'll say this one do this. He says, but it's not each one individually. I'm making a special formula. When you mix them together, it's going to do the work in reducing any blood gathered in the brain and bring his eyes back into focus. He said, it's ugly. He said, boy, it's not going to taste good. You know, he said, but in seven days, he'll be fine. I'll see you back in seven days. Sure enough, it worked. You see, he was saying it's not the one thing. It's not even the three things. It's 11 different things that you must mixed together and that tonic is going to work. Here it says, not the one thing, not this ugly thing, but it's this ugly thing, this thing, this disgusting, untasteful thing, and this all coupled together and then add some honey and that mixture is going to work together for good. So it's not the death in the family. It's not the report of the sickness. It's not the unemployment. It's not the challenges and the deep testings and even the dark night of your soul and the things that are happening. It is all of that together. It's that where friends come in and counsel comes in and even rebukes from God and the time you go in now and sit with God because no one can give you anything but God. All of that working together is working for your good. Do you realize why it behooves us to be believers that are just known to get away and be alone with God? Amen. We can't walk with the joy of faith in these amazing promises if we just want to always grab them on the run like Pop-Tarts or potato chips. It requires thinking men, thinking women. Isaac was seen in the middle of the field. The sun was going down, and we see this man just meditating in the field in the evening time. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. We've been summoned by Jesus for a purpose, God's purpose. It's rigged. 
He called us. We didn't call him. We didn't apply for this. We didn't, you know, like Black Friday, go wait outside the building and the first one to elbow our way in. He made us have a head-on collision with his love. And we saw him. He chose us. And when he chose us, there was a purpose in mind. And that's why everything has to work for good because the sovereign one saved us with a purpose and nothing's going to change that. Psalm 73 verse 24 says, Lord, you will guide me with your counsel. And when you're done, when you're done, you will receive me into glory. That's why it behooves us to meditate on the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Do you want a definition of the sovereignty of God? The sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of his supremacy. You like that? A.W. Pink gave that definition. The sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of his supremacy. Wow, the supremacy of God. Supremacy? Supremacy speaks of the infinite distance which separates the mightiest but yet mere creature from the almighty creator. Supremacy. So sovereignty is the exercise of his supremacy. Him being supreme is his sovereignty. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Pink further said in his book, The Attributes of God, the God we preach of in so many pulpits today that we write about in so many books published today, which we proclaim at so many Bible conferences today, is only a flicker of the true sovereign God of the Bible. He said as much as just a small candle is just so and such a small amount of what you would compare to the sun midday, so what we walk around and proclaim and say about God's in control, God reigns, he says that it is but a flicker of but who God truly is. What he's saying is we live in a day where we're throwing the doctrine around, we're amening the doctrine, the awe is gone, the reverence is gone, the selah is gone of how much God reigns and we're all settling for just quoting it around and then just treating it like just a great intro before you talk to the Lord. Oh, sovereign one, and then there we go right into it. Our heart's not even touched by what we just said. Sovereign Lord. To believe that should be such an end to the worry that plagues us all, such an end to the anxiety that wants to rob our sleep and rob our joy. God is in control. He is sovereign. We need to be those that are not just quoting this beautiful attribute, but knowing and living in those verses that say it. I'm just going to read a few verses on the sovereignty of God, and you can write them down. Job 42, verse 2. I know that you can do everything and that no thought of yours can be hindered. Psalms 115, verse 3, but our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he pleased. Proverbs 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12, thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for Everything in the heaven and everything in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted and head above all, and you reign over all. Not will reign during the millennial reign. You reign right now. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6, O Lord God of our fathers, are not you God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one can withstand you? Job 23, verse 13, but he is in one mind and who can turn him and what his soul desires, even that he does. Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And check this out. You ready? Exodus 34, verse 24, the Israelites came into the land, yes? They evicted all of these Canaanite warriors that didn't want to give the land up. Remember, you read through the Old Testament, they were using every opportunity they could to try to go and take that land back one inch at a time, right? Look at what the Lord says here. Exodus 34, 24. I will cast out the nations before you 
and I will enlarge your borders. Neither will anyone desire your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. Remember, there were specific Jewish feasts where all the males, all the warriors had to go up to Jerusalem to worship. He's saying, I'm so sovereign while y'all are gone and just the wife and kids are home, I'm going to take away the desire of all of those covetous warrior demonic nations that would any other time seize the opportunity to do a takeover. I'm going to take their desire away while you're gone. He reigns. He reigns. Ephesians 1.11 says, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. Romans 11, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's why it says in James 4, thus, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we're going to go to the city and we're going to go stay there for one year and we're going to buy and sell while we're there and then we're going to go again in the future. He says, don't even talk like that. What you need to say, James 4 verse 15, is if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that saying God is so in control, you cannot go where you even think you want to go. What you should say is, Lord willing, we will go. Remember Jesus said, not a bird can fall to the ground without our Father's permission. Now, you know these little finches that fly around. If one finch just kicked the bucket, just got too close to that cat, just flew into a car, would the Bird Watcher Society of Philly be in any bit of tough luck? There's so many of them. But he says even just one of those dime a dozen finches cannot fall to the ground, cannot expire unless I allow it to. He is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's sovereign. And the sovereign one says everything in your life is working together for your good. Let's read again. All things work together for good. But look at what it says here, to them that love God. You see, when we just quote the verse, hey, all things work together for good, this is not applied to the non-believer. This is not applied to the one that wants to remain a stranger, you know, to the covenants, you know, and a stranger to, to, to God through Jesus Christ. It says for those that love God. We could just quote the verse, hey, you know, all things work together for good. Oh, I needed to hear that. No, no. It says all things work together for good is talking about believers. More so, it says all things work together for good to them that love God. You see, when you love God, underline when you love God, when you love God, when you want to love God more, all things work together for good. Because when I love God, I want to be his man. I want to be his baby boy. I want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. I want to grow. I want what he wants for me. That's why all things work together for good. If you love God, everything works together for your good. The good is working for your good. The bad that God allows in our life, doesn't, it doesn't say we know why all bad happens, but the bad works together for your good. Evil ends up working together for your good. Temptation ends up working together for your good as you get to go and share with others and have a giant wake-up call of how nasty our heart is and how real temptation can be and makes you run to Jesus like never before and you know you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it relying on old manna and old Bible verses you memorized you know, years ago. It works together for good. doesn't say hey, all these things are good. They work together for good. Sin, as you come to find the vileness of your heart, and you knew that your heart was dark matter, but you did not know that it could go to that level, even as a believer. But see, if you love God, you're going to be one that hates sin. And though you may fall into something grotesque, it works together for good because it makes you learn more of the gospel, hate sin more, and want to pursue this all-forgiving, all-good Savior like never before. Do you know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who have been summoned according to his purpose? It says, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, 
he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to all of this? There's only one thing to say. If God is for me, who will be against me? Now, it doesn't say that there won't be opposition. It doesn't say that there won't be those against you. It just says, who can be victorious in coming against me? Because people, things will come against you. It just says, nothing can be victorious against me if God is for me. Now, here's some terms that are pretty big, but we do need to know them. It says, whom he did foreknow. God foreknew us. He said to Jeremiah, before you were even a baby in your mama's womb, I already knew you and already ordained you for your ministry. What does it mean that God foreknew us? Every one of us in here as believers can celebrate and rest in that God foreknew us. What does that mean? Well, write down Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Because it says there that Jesus Christ was delivered to die for our sins by the predeterminate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. The predeterminate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. You could tell already that's, that's some meat right there, right? Let's get technical for one minute, but I promise we'll be in and out, but you will want this. There's a construction in the Greek grammar called the Granville Sharps Rule. What it says is if you take two nouns and they both have the same case, predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge, Take two nouns with the same case. If they're joined by an and, and there's only a definite article in front of the first one and not the second one, the predeterminate counsel, the definite article, the predeterminate counsel, and not the foreknowledge, but just and foreknowledge. Two nouns, same case, joined by an and, only a definite article in the beginning. It says that the two words actually mean the same thing and the second word actually will get more of its definition from the first word. So what does predeterminate counsel mean? It means, it says Jesus was delivered by the predeterminate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. It means that in eternity past, check this out, the three persons of the triune Godhead convened, convened to talk on which of them would be the Lamb of God to die for the sins of mankind. And as they convened, their predeterminate counsel came to the conclusion. And it doesn't just mean the conclusion of a meeting, but it means the, the certainty of sovereignty that the second person, the Son of God, would be the one. And then the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge, it says in 1 Peter 1.20, Christ was foreordained to die for us from the foundation of the world. You see, that's the same construction here where it says that God foreknew us. It means that in God's grace, of which we'll never understand the three persons of the triune God had convened and they discussed saving each one of us and who would be in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says, from the foundation of the world. They convened and it was determined that each one of us would be his. And then it says that whom he foreknew, he also predestinated. Predestinated is from the Greek word where we get the word horizon line. Just as a horizon line separates ocean from sky, we not only were picked and not only was there a convening to set out that we would indeed be summoned and called to be his, but then we were hedged in by horizon lines, meaning predestined, that we would be led in the way of Christ confirmation all the way up until he took us into heaven, that nothing would come in our life but what he allowed, and that he, as the potter, would be meticulously and perfectly picky over every detail, and nothing would come onto the clay but what the potter allowed, and the potter would only allow what would shape this vessel into the vessel of honor that he's already made us to be. Amen. He's chosen us. He's hedged us in with a plan for us. Jude 24, unto him that's able to keep you from falling and slipping. And then it says that he predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. 
we've been called not to love our comfort zones, not to make our own mark in the world, not to build our own reputation, but to be conformed to look like Jesus. It says in the word that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. You don't hear that verse preached about much, but it's in Hebrews. Jesus being fully God, fully man. As fully God, he knew all things, but yet as fully man, he still learned things. And it says he learned deeper surrender through the sufferings that came into his life. We have been predestinated, hedged in by horizon lines with God at work to conform us to the image of Jesus, to make us not just talk like him, not just say the stuff he said, but to look like him, to smell like him, to have a heart like like his, and he leads us through ups and downs, mountains and valleys, and he teaches us surrender through suffering. Teaches us to lean on him through seasons of confusion. Teaches us to seek him during times when no human around you makes sense. It's all designed to conform us into his image and likeness. Why? So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, you've read that before, but what do we do when we read a portion of Scripture that we don't understand? We say, all right, I get 80% of it. Firstborn among many brethren, time to move on. What it means is this. We are walking around, and as the Lord is decreasing us, and that's giving more room for Christ to increase we are giving off more of an aroma of Christ. That's the goal. We are looking more like Christ. Our heart is a heart that's more like Christ, delighting in mercy, delighting in grace, standing for truth, loving God's glory. He is making us look more like him. And things will be allowed in your life, one, to test you, two, to let you see whether you've grown more than you realize or whether you have a lot more growing up to do. And it says the ultimate goal is it so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. First off, note that Jesus calls all of us his little brothers and his little sisters. The word says he's not ashamed to call us brothers. Two, it says, as we walk around conformed into his image, being more salt and light for him, it's designed so that people see our lives and see Jesus and say that, wow, among all of these Jesus followers, they make their big brother, the firstborn, the head of their lives look really good. He is bringing us to a place. It's not about anything but Jesus looking good in our lives. Are we beginning to realize that? But we want to try to mix us looking good with Jesus looking good and upholding Jesus' rep, but also protecting our rep. Now we're double-minded, and the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But when we realize that all of what it's about, life's ups, downs, twists, turns, feeling like all things are against me, having a faith problem and coming to realize God is sovereign, all things are working for me, we come to realize that all it's about is Jesus having more room so when we walk around as little bro and little sis, we make big bro look really good and people give him glory, both believers and non-believers alike. Amen? Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he called, and whom he called, he justified, meaning forgiving us of all of our sin and giving us his perfect righteousness. And then it says, and whom he justified, then he glorified. Glorified refers to when we go to heaven and get our new bodies and abide with him forever. It should say, whom he justified, he will one day glorify, but it doesn't. It's in the past tense. It means that he already sees all of this as a done deal. He already sees us. The plan is as good as done. It's rigged. It's a wrap. The sovereign one said, I called you. I got you. Nothing will come in your life but what I allow. And what I allow in your life, it will work for good. You just keep loving me, seeking me, trusting me, humbling yourself before me, keeping your heart soft so I can mold it. Stop telling me what I know and just listen for what me telling you of what truth is. Let me remind you of my promises. Come before me empty. If any man seemeth to be wise in this world, go back to being a fool again so that you can be built back up as wise in the wisdom of God again. Get personal revival. The Lord says, I want to give you something to make you feel like you just got saved again. Amen. And it says, everything works together for good. Everything works together for good. We know this, we know this, we know this. Amen. So let's have the worship team come up now. And as they do, I'd like to just draw attention to this one verse where it says that 
He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. What does it just say? We've been hedged in with the mission. Everything's coming into our life with the mission of making us look more like Jesus. But please understand that if you take the carnal believer that just wants to think that this means they can live any way they want, yeah, God is faithful, but all things may not work out for the best. You see, that's why it says it works for the good of them that love God. God is faithful, and of all of his sheep, he will lose none. But some sheep will choose second best, will get addicted to second best, and they will end up settling for less than what the Lord has for them. The Lord said in the Old Testament, they liked water out of the rock. I wanted to give them honey from the rock, but they limited me. We can limit God. So please don't think this verse just means that because it's here and because God is sovereign, that you could just take two of these and then guarantee that no matter how much you seek God and how much you want to be taught by God and humble yourself, that it's just, just whatever. No, no, no. All things work together for good of them that love God, that are fighting to love him, fighting to seek him, caring about what he feels in a situation instead of what we feel in a situation. All things work together for good for them that love God. And when we love God, my brothers and sisters, let's get on a mission like never before to love God. Because when you love God, I mean, I could talk about, you know, when a young man and a young gal come to the church and, you know, first it's just like a wave and a wave and then they begin talking. Oh, now they're sitting together. And after service, they used to always want to hang around and talk to everyone. Oh, but not now. Now after service, they're gone as soon as the last word is given. You see what love does? Makes you want to get alone with a person, spend time with a person. You don't see them during that stage saying, well, I'm too busy to sit with you today. You don't see them during that stage, well, I'm too busy to talk with you after service. Everyone else is like, when are you going to talk to us? Remember us? Do we love Jesus? Do we want to love Jesus in a way that even makes human beings around you say, remember me? And I don't mean doing church business because you could be neglecting all yours and just be a Martha. No, I'm talking about loving Jesus in a way where everyone clearly sees that he is number one in your life. The Bible says you fight for that kind of love. Everything's going to work together for good. Everything is going to work together for good. So look, if you're here today and you're a backslider, if you make the decision now, you know what? I got to love the Lord. I can't play with Jesus. He's not a get-out-of-jail-free card in Monopoly. He's a person. I want to come to him today with my backslidings. The Bible says he'll heal your backslidings. If you're addicted to some kind of sin, you know what? I'm going to seek him like never before. It says, Micah chapter 7, he will conquer your addictions and your iniquities. If you're like, my heart is hard, I'm angry, and I feel a certain way. But if you say, but I'm going to love you, Lord. He will make that work for good and let you experience what it is like to have your heart melted in an instant. All things work together for good if we continue loving God. We get it? Amen. So just like Jacob went through all of what he went through, right, to be brought to a place where he knew he so needed God like never before, God allows things in our lives to bring us to a place where being pharisaical just won't do anymore. Memorizing and quoting so much Bible just won't do anymore. We start to need the person, not just the words of the person, the living person. And the Lord wants to conform us. It says all things work together for good, that we've been picked and predestinated to be conformed to look like Jesus. What we all are experiencing if we just open our eyes to see, is God is engineering things in every one of our lives to bring us to a place of emptying ourselves and crying out for his Holy Spirit. Because that's the only way to become more Christ-like. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that the Spirit is bringing us from glory to glory of Christ-likeness all things work together for good. Whatever's going on in our life, God allowed it. A bird can't fall to the ground unless he says so. He's permitted it to break us, to humble us, to show us if we're teachable or not, to test us. It says that God tested Abraham in Genesis 22. The Hebrew word is sniff. He put Abraham in a test to smell what's really in him. And so Abraham could smell what's really in him, but all designed to bring Abraham to a place either way of crying out for more of God. 
You see, even this message ties into us crying out for the Holy Spirit. Amen? We're going to do this. We're going to worship now. And I'm going to invite anyone today who would like a filling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, remember, we don't want to have a faith problem. Sometimes we're focusing on all so many of our lesser problems. The biggest problem is a faith problem. He says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, I will give it. In the book of Acts, they were so certain they wouldn't move till they got it. The Bible says, be filled over and over with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, without my Holy Spirit, you could do nothing. It says, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. So many of us are so tired. God's allowing that tiredness. It says, if the blade of the ax becomes blunt, you got to work much harder, Ecclesiastes says. But wisdom comes along and sharpens the blade. Maybe you've just been trying to do this in your own strength. All things work together for good. He's just letting you fail over and over again so that like Romans 7, you will get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you will want the Holy Spirit. All things work together for good. Everything. That's why every person in here, no matter what your story is on your way to your seat today, should say, amen. I'm willing to take all of it, hit the equal sign, and it means I need to come down here and I need to pray for more of the Holy Spirit. I need to pray. I need a complete makeover. David said, give me a whole new heart. I don't even want you to fix this one up. Give me a whole new one. You spoke the world into existence. You spoke wine to tap water. I want you to speak the word and give me a whole new heart. So, Father, we thank you for your time today. And, Lord, we love you and we love what you're doing in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.